I worked um, one summer at the Ohio State University Hospitals in Columbus, and uh, I was among a small army of student chaplains, all from all the local seminaries, and there were seminaries dotted all around that city. We each took turns uh, being on call. We each took turns having a pager uh, in those days. This was a large university hospital in a fairly large city. I thought it was a huge city at the time, so I moved here. So it was busy. It was almost a guarantee that at some time during the overnight shift, you were going to be paged for something and probably have to go in. And you didn't mind most of the time being paged. I mean, most of it was pretty interesting things, even if it was tragic. You didn't mind being called to the emergency room. You really didn't mind um, being called to the surgery waiting rooms, even the ICU. Uh, even the, the psych ward had some interesting things in it. But there were two places that we had all, as a group of uh, chaplains, decided that two places you didn't want to be called. And that was the burn unit and pediatrics. The burn unit took a toll on you. It required a really unique set of skills, and if you were ever called to the burn unit, you were always called in mass, and there was always the lead chaplain that went with you, because the devastation went in absolutely every direction. Well, one night I was on call, and I got paged, and I got paged to pediatrics. I entered the room to find a mother who was, of course, strapped to IVs, lying in the bed. She had just given birth, not too long earlier. The father was over in the corner, sort of staring out the window, swaying back and forth. I would learn in just a minute or two that he was completely drunk. There was no baby in the room. He had died in the process of being born. They were arguing. They were sullen, grieving. They were really loud. They spoke shockingly unkind words to one another. The mother wanted the baby to be baptized. I couldn't tell if the father cared at all, because he, at that point, had not turned toward me at all. They did agree, however, on one thing, the reason that the baby had died. It was God's punishment. God was punishing them. We knew we should have stopped, they said back and forth, almost antiphonally. We couldn't stop. They were smokers. That's as far as they would admit of what they were. I'm sure they were more than that. I could tell they were smokers because everything in the hospital was sterile except for the smell of cigarette smoke, which hung heavy in the air. They had done this together, they admitted, this man and this woman. And this was God's punishment for them being bad people. That's the one thing that united them. This piece of theology was probably the only thing that kept that man swaying in the corner and not running out of the room. To them, this was absolute truth. As if God had somewhere in the time between the call that I got and the time I arrived, that God had come down and told them himself that this was what the reason was. Now, I was a budding theologian, and I felt great temptation to correct this really bad theology, but I realized that it was the one conceptual thing that was really holding them together. It was holding their world together at this point. It was really the only safe place that they had constructed together to make sense of this tragedy. And without it, I didn't know what would happen. I hardly knew what was going to happen anyway. We all have heard this kind of thinking. We all know this kind of thinking. It's absurd. Over the years, I've been infuriated, wanting to pull my hair out. It's surprising I have any left because of what Christians project. Absolutely every time there's some tragic event in the world 
some nincompoop Christian theologian puts out there an obscenity. This is God's punishment for something. A shooting. It's God's punishment for something that's gone wrong. A tsunami. It's God's punishment for what ill we have allowed to exist. An earthquake or a hurricane or a flood is God's wrath on humanity for some ill we've created, some failure at some specific point, either individually or globally. It's absurd. Something happens in the Middle East. Everybody, everybody becomes Armageddon watchers. It's absurd. To Westboro Baptist Church, this theology, I'm talking to you, this theology is their whole mission. They say U.S. soldiers are being killed as God's condemnation for our allowance of homosexuality. Really? 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 And they will stop at nothing to inflict pain on families who are already grieving the death of their son or their daughter. How dare you? In the name of God. We all know this kind of thinking. It's absurd. And we can point it out and see it in our world and just shake our heads and pull our hair out and get outraged, as I got just a moment ago. <laughs> but we know it on a whole other level, don't we? Not just in those people and those kind of churches, but we know it a whole other level. And it's absurd. Even those who claim to know better find a way to get into it. Calamity strikes and we wonder what we did wrong. Or we want to know that big question. Why? And we aren't bad investigators. I mean, we are really bright creatures. And we scrutinize our behaviors, we look at our relationships, our diets, our beliefs, and we hunt for some cause to explain the effect in hopes that we can stop the cause, and therefore the effect. And we lock on, oftentimes, to some kind of random idea, sometimes theological ones, and we refuse to listen to any other reasons that move in the opposite direction. And I think this tells us that we're less interested in the truth than we are the consequences. What we crave above all else is the desire to somehow lasso, to get control over the chaos that life can be. And this link between cause and effect doesn't just seem to go in the way of disaster. We use it in our culture on the way towards success. I mean, we can understand it in disaster because it's too frightening to think that perhaps it's more random than that, to think that we're just happened to be the wrong people in the wrong place at the exactly wrong time, and there just may be no reason. And that idea simply just freaks us out. We don't also like to think that we're not in charge of our success. Though no one chose to be born into affluence in the first world, in the most affluent country in the nations of the world, no one takes credit for the advantages of living in such a nation, such a time as this, and it freaks us out to think that we're not in control of our own success. And that's why it's so difficult to be unemployed, and at this time so difficult to be unemployable and not to find a job. Because for all estimations, you're a decent human being, but you just can't seem to find a job in this market. And so you look for reasons. What have I done wrong? How can I improve myself? What's my problem? <coughs> oh, we know this thinking. We do it all the time. In our gospel reading, I was going to preach on the second reading because it's so disastrous as well, but in our gospel reading, please don't use the phrase, God won't give you more than you can handle. Let me just, amen, on that part. Okay, let's move on uh, to the next part. We aren't told the reason that Jesus informed, uh, was informed of the Galileans whose blood was mingled with their sacrifice. Something had happened in the temple. There's no record of it. We don't know what it was. That, but somehow Pilate in the temple had killed some people. Not Pilate himself, I'm sure, but gave an order. The implication is those who died got what they deserved. That's kind of the idea behind it, at least the question that Jesus seemed to intuit. Because he says this, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way that they were worse sinners than everybody else from Galilee? Now notice, 
All these guys are from Galilee. Okay? So let's cut a little close, Jesus. Don't tell me you haven't thought about it. It's a very easy way to think. It really tidies things up a whole lot. really helps us line things up in our head. It's tempting. And that tempting kind of equation isn't. And it solves a lot of problems. One, it answers the riddle of why bad things happen to good people. They don't happen to good people. They only happen to bad people. And if something happened to them, it must be because they're bad. Two, it punishes sinners right there out in the open as a warning to everybody else. Works well for sermons that are very didactic. Three, it gives us a God who obeys the laws of physics. And if anything that we want, we want a God who's tame and domesticated and our side of the God equation. For every action, there is this physics professor God. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. End of lecture. Any questions? I'll tie it up. Makes perfect sense. It might be me kind of thinking until you begin to think about what kind of God you have left at the end of such a process. When the conversation is over, who is God? And it's a tempting equation, but Jesus doesn't go there. No, he tells the crowd, but unless you repent, you all perish as they do. That, that's comforting, <laughs> sort of. I grew up with the phrase, my father would say, you, you, giving with one hand and taking away with the other. You ever heard that phrase? No? No. When my father comes, I'll have him give you the lecture. And, and, the, and the word of the wise is sufficient, which is basically sit down and shut up. Sorry. Dad. The bus. Why are you recording this, Terry? Wasn't in my notes, Dad. It's not here for perpetuity. <laughs> Jesus seems to correct the idea of a link between sin and suffering. That's kind of good news. But unless you repent, you'll also perish, like they did. And just for emphasis, he says it again, twice, with two examples. It appears that Jesus doesn't want us to be too comfortable. I mean, on one hand, it's comforting. On the other hand, it's a little unnerving. Not quite sure what it means then. He doesn't want us to be too confident in being secure, especially being ideologically comfortable and conceptually safe when it makes God into some kind of tyrant. I mean, think of a God that we have that acts this way. All we can say about the statements of giving in one hand comfort and the other taking it away is it's just disarming. We're not sure what to make of it. Left at this point, we wouldn't know exactly what to say about it. But Jesus doesn't stop there. At the point he sort of stunned his listeners, he rushes on into another story, a parable. A parable is a story with a point. It's about an unproductive fig tree planted in a vineyard. Oh, there's a point there that I'm just going to skip today. Why is there a fig tree in a vineyard? But anyway, we're moving on. <laughs> just as in these ideas about cosmic justice, we in the church love to mess up parables. And you know how we do it, right? We assign roles. We love to assign roles of parables. It's so fun. It's like a riddle. Words with friends. We can figure it out. It's going to work out great. And usually when we do it, we paint God into a terrible corner. Let's do it just for fun. Okay? For example, in this parable, who's the landowner? Who always owns all the land? God. God. And who's the gardener, usually? Who's the nice guy who's always trying to help out? Jesus. And who's the land? Who's the fig tree? Us! Oh, you're so good at it. I love allegory. It's wonderful. It's so good. And so now we have this impatient, tyrannical God who just wants to rip you out. The mighty smiter is back. Right? Right? You're unproductive for a few years. The first three years of a pig's life, they don't produce any fruit. Period. What kind of God is this? Won't even wait the designated created time period that he gave to fig trees. He won't even wait that long. 
He wants to smite them while they're still not capable of, capable of being fruitful. What kind of God is this? Is that the kind of God you want to have? Is that the kind of God we want to be left with? A smiter, capricious, unpredictable, unloving? Has to be placated by Buddy Jesus who says, Dude, settle out. Leave them to me for a little while. I'll straighten them out. Is that the kind of God we want? Is that the kind of Jesus that we want? Is that the kind of God we have? Now usually parables really turn things on their heads and they usually just leave us steaming. Talk about all the economic parables and everybody in finance goes crazy. Anybody who manages people thinks that's just absurd. That they're not meant to be parables in life. They're meant to be stories about how the kingdom works. So let's just, let's just Rubik's Cube this one again and let's turn it for a second. Let's turn it another way than the way that we you know, kind of knee-jerk want to do. God's the landowner, Jesus is the gardener, and we're the fig tree, and he's going to smite us. Okay? So let, let's, let's we're going to got that held up. Okay, now we're going to turn it. We're going to turn it in a whole new direction. Let's reassign some parts just to stay with the model that we're working on. Now, go back to the opening part, the first opening verses of our lesson for today. Verses 1 to 5. Okay? Where the people come and they tell Jesus about cause and effect. Right? In the parable, there is somebody who's using cause and effect thinking, right? Who's using cause and effect thinking in the parable? I know, this is hard. The Open your Bible, it's chapter 13. There'll be a test. Um, the landowner. No produce? Chop it down. Don't produce? Pull it out. Waste the space? Put something else good in. Okay, cause and effect. The landowner is cause and effect. Who in the opening phrases is using cause and effect thinking? And who's speaking against cause and effect thinking? The people around Jesus are the ones who are using cause and effect thinking. Look at those Galileans, Jesus. What do you think? Were they worse than everybody else? So good, so good gossip, uh, gossip when we get back to Galilee and talk about those families. They must have been terrible people. And Jesus is like, no. And then he adds his own story about the tower that fell on him. No, he says, there's no cause and effect here. Who suggests that we should not link suffering with sin? Is the people? Oh, it's Jesus. Okay, let's go to the reassignment. Okay? What if in the parable of the fig tree, Jesus remains the caretaker? And then who's the bean counter? Who are the landowners? The ones demanding fruit production, cause and effect? We are. Oh, if that shoe fits, it still stinks. We are. Does it change the equation to think that somehow Jesus is now arguing for patience and compassion and more time and care while we are clamoring for swift action, for cutting down the tree, for something more worthwhile? I mean, look at how swiftly we rush to cause and effect when we want legislation over things like gun violence, vengeance when we're wrong, litigation when we're offended. Oh, we are addicted to cause and effect. We love counting beans, and if we are off by one, we are going to take it any way we can. I would suggest that we're the ones that are the mighty smiters, not God. The couple in that hospital room at Ohio State University were locked in cause and effect. They were judging. No, they were, they were condemning themselves. And they were smiting each other in the process. Her hostility, striking out from the bed. His bottle, a solution that created a multitude of other problems. And sharing words that tore like knives into their flesh in each other. Man, it was fire and brimstone in there. This is my fire and brimstone sermon. I think it's the only time I've used that phrase. <laughs> it was fire and brimstone in there. It was a living hell. Sinners in the hands of angry sinners. Mighty smiters. I'd gone to ask for the baby. Because the baby wasn't there. And the nurse, who didn't even speak to me, swiveled in her chair and walked into the nursing station, a part in which I couldn't follow her. I went back to the room. 
It was a long time until she came. I could understand why the nurse had a curt response and was so uncooperative with me when I came for an earlier request for them because I had spent time in that room and I couldn't stand them anymore. I judged them. I wanted to smite them. They were terrible people. And I knew that the nurse hated them too because when she came back, she gave me a Ziploc bag with a tiny little baby in it and a bedpan, not the new kind, an old kind that was all beat up. And she suggested, the only thing she said to me the entire time, that if I was going to open the bag, you might want to put him in the bedpan. You got the metaphor, right? She had strong feelings about what was going on in that room. The nurse found a safe conceptual corner in which she could shield herself in order to deal with this difficult couple and the harsh reality that somebody, which was lost in the whole fray, somebody had lost their life. Somebody didn't have a future. Nobody was really thinking about them. I asked if she couldn't do better, something better, and she did. And she stayed in the room, actually, when I opened the bag, and I poured water down into it, over the baby's head, down over that tiny little baby's body, and everybody in the room grew silent. It struck me that the only one in the room that was not wanting to smite anyone was the name in whom we baptized. This child belongs to God again, I said. The mother had stopped her yelling and her weeping. She reached out her hand, and the man stepped away and stopped swaying and moved closer. Even the nurse handed me a towel, softer. For a moment, Grace overflowed its banks, flooded into this unlikely congregation of five souls. And if only for a moment, if only for a moment, we all belong to God. Again. The only good news we have in our passage today is when we turn it around and we look at who likes to smite and who always comes at us with eternal and everlasting love. And so I close with the words of those condemning prophets, Isaiah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake their way, the unrighteous, their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, God says. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. And my thoughts, well, they're far beyond your thoughts. Thanks be to God for his everlasting love. Amen.